This is part two of a four-part miniseries. If you've missed the first part, Jonathan Colton is a musician. He wrote a song called Tom Cruise Crazy, and after a number of years of success, he decided to host a cruise called Joko Cruise Crazy. I went on that, and we're just about to take off. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, Jeff Atwood, Eric Vitello, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Cruise ships are very odd things. They maintain many of the trappings of maritime transport, but they are, at their core, massive warehouses of food, staff, and passengers designed to go nowhere fast, enjoy doing so, and eat an enormous amount of food. And as we walked up the ramp to the MS Eurodam of Holland America, it took quite a bit of time to understand the kind of world we were walking into. In many ways, a cruise ship feels like a very large, very intense hotel. There's an industrialized style of luxury that inhabits every floor. The carpets are plush, the colors are vibrant, there's brass everywhere, and the sun peeks in through windows in different rooms designed to have a feeling of expansiveness colliding with the utilitarian reality of being a floating platform on the sea. The first thing you do on a cruise ship after your check-in and verifying your papers is trying to figure out a consistent way to get to your cabin, going down a set of stairs, moving down the right hallway, and determining which number is yours. If you've done any amount of traveling and stayed in a variety of hotels, then a cruise ship cabin is no surprise to you. It is just functional enough to give you a place to sleep, a place to write a letter, a place to look out a very small window, and a bathroom with a functioning shower. Naturally, there are upgrades galore. After unpacking what you need to, and then making sure you can find your cabin again, it's natural to explore this ship, docked as it is, before it takes off. In this case, the Eurodam held about a thousand people, of which a few hundred were part of the Joko cruise. So, besides the standard issue 20 to 40 something geeks, there was also a variety of elderly people, families, and folks who, who found interest in a cruise far away from anything thematic. I discovered long ago that I like to understand the confined space that I'm in in any given situation, to walk it over, to case it out, to understand the geography. Maps are nice, but that's a big difference between walking the physical spaces to understand what you're dealing with. There were varieties of verandas and decks and rooms, each of them serving a specific function. There were areas clearly marked as not for passengers, and other areas designed just for a certain class of passenger. Part of the incentive of being a guest star on this cruise, besides the joy of meeting the fan, were some really nice luxury rooms at the top of the ship, with beautiful views and wide open spaces. I never saw inside them. But I did find the variety of decks, places you could stand, railings you could look over, rooms that moved on to other rooms, and a variety of stores restaurants, shops, and a casino. That industrial luxury I mentioned is everywhere. The ships maintain utilitarianism where they need to, but do their best to dress up in the common areas. That said, it's impossible not to show wear or tear the closer you stare at them. But they are clearly meant, if you squint, to seem like gleaming, brand new, breathtaking experience. Registering for the Joko Cruise events once on the ship, that's how I found out we were the first non-staff people to get a ticket. 
and also that some of the organizers involved in that geek cruise of so many years ago were also involved in Joko Cruise Crazy. As the interest in Pearl and Linux-themed cruises had waned down, so it had been that an entire functionality had been lost and found again, organized around this musician. At this point, it helps to understand exactly how to think about the Joko Cruise. It was a conference, a party, an event. While the novelty of being on a cruise ship was there, in every other way, it was like a Joko-themed conference. The kind of thing you'd rent a conference center for, or be at a multi-day venue event, curated by Jonathan Colton, of people he had worked with, people he admired, and providing all sorts of activities for what he and his staff thought his fans might enjoy. Here's what Jonathan thought people would enjoy. A game room full of board games. A series of concerts where different configurations of the performers, having practiced for weeks beforehand, provided unique shows or unique breakdowns of the kind of work they did. A series of panels also provided from these different guests about a subject they knew or something people might want to ask them about. Parties and events, lunches, dinners, after-dinner drinks, after-dinner parties, and late-night parties, either around a theme or simply as another opportunity for the different guests to meet each other. A karaoke-style event where Jonathan Colton set up instrumental versions of his songs, allowing people to sing their favorites in front of the person who had written them. And, of course, a number of t-shirts and products that you could pick up during the entire cruise. That either sounds like a lot or nothing at all. I can assure you, it was a lot. And stacked on top of that were the standard ports of calls of a Caribbean cruise. Half Moon K in the Bahamas, Ocho Rios in Jamaica, and Georgetown in the Cayman Islands before returning back to Fort Lauderdale. Two of the days were sea days, where the ship would be on the sea for the entire time. Other days, the ship would be parked off the coast of an island, and you would travel around on a series of events and parties before going back on the ship later in the night before its departure time. And that, in the coldest and clinical of descriptions, is what the Joko Cruise was. But that's the difference, isn't it, between a cold list of items and experiencing something? Here's what the experience was like. My relationship to conferences has varied over the years, going from hacker conferences and fan conferences, co-hosting parties that might as well have been a conference, and showing up to a whole variety of other events based on being asked to speak there or knowing somebody who's running it. And not surprisingly, the difference between something on the paper and the experience is the people. The kind of folks that you meet on your way, where all of you have at least a sense of the same goals or the same things you enjoy, a position that you can all agree on before you diverge. For us, the people who were on that cruise all loved Jonathan Colton. They loved the music that he wrote, the geekiness that he approached things, and they enjoyed the work of the acts that he would highlight or tell us we would enjoy. A ukulele player named Molly Lewis, a pair of performers named Paul and Storm, actors like Will Wheaton and John Hodgman, and a set of people I'd never heard about. In fact, at one of the parties, I bumped into one of the featured acts and said, I know nothing about you, and I'm really looking forward to finding out everything about you. I'm not exactly sure how that landed with him, but John Roderick was very nice about it. Meanwhile, there was one particular person I was really looking forward to meeting, and his name was David Rees, the creator of a set of comic books that were brilliant in their own way. My fighting technique is unstoppable, and get your war on. Both of them exquisite in their humor. 
and David Rees had been, for various uses of the term, reclusive, not really willing to do many public appearances. But here was a chance to see him in action. He did not disappoint. I'll rest my case on one of his first acts when the cruise started. David Rees announced that he was heading up a very specific subgroup within the Joko Cruise, the Internet Temperance League, who swore that even though they could use their cell phones, even though they could use the Internet for an exorbitant fee, they would swear that not once during the entire time on the cruise would people go online. To do this, he raised his hand, asked us to, and those of us who bought in proceeded to read out an oath that he gave us to say, declaring that we would not, in the face of temptation, not once decide to go online. His speech has faded from my memory, but it was beautifully put together, something out of the 1800s redesigned for the 21st century. On the weight of David Rees's oath, I felt very good that this cruise was going to be something very special. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Mark Pilgrim, Peter Healy, Emilio Oliveira, Ernie Hershey, Michael Rubin, Matt Reynolds, Manxalot, Sean Kelly, John Sturm, Trixie the Cat, Dileep Reddy, and Anonymous, along with the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Part of the culture and rules of different cruise lines revolve around the seating arrangements. In one realm, you move around with each meal. In another, you are assigned a place among the tables, and then you sit next to the very same people, day in and day out. In doing so, you build new relationships, new people to look forward to, folks that provide you an anchor, if you wish, in your social calendar. We did more of a hybrid. There were couples we sat with more often than not, and there were also people that we hung out with for the very first time for only one meal. But there was one couple I will particularly remember. They were cruise veterans. They were very interesting because they seemed so young, but they had been on dozens of cruises. They had gone all over the world, trying all different places. They had very specific opinions about different cruise lines and different ships. They gave us context as to the Joko cruise, whether Holland America had this advantage going for it or this disadvantage against it. They were just the sort of universal perspective that we needed to understand that some of the strange things we saw on that cruise were on all cruise lines, while others were unique to this one. For what it's worth, Holland America wasn't their favorite cruise line, and there were different ports and destinations that they preferred to go to. But they appreciated Jonathan Colton making a go at it, and they were glad to be a part of it. They had some young children they were looking forward to bringing on cruises in the future, and I hope that they continued on that way, because they seemed so happy about it. And I, after all, was probably never going on a cruise again. <laughs>